Hi friends, I'm Gio, and welcome to my channel. I write and enjoy gay fiction, which I present here. If you enjoy, I'd appreciate a like or a comment, or you can even subscribe. It helps my little channel out a lot. This story is called Swim. Let's begin. I never learned how to swim, so why am I at a swimming pool? An Olympic-sized NCAA competition legal swimming pool. I'm Terrence Block the Third. My friends call me Terry. My mom, when she wants to annoy me, calls me her baby Tear Tear. My dad calls me Junior. My best friend and roommate, Omar, calls me the Klutz. I don't know why he's complaining. I replaced our coffee maker, and I only had to turn our flat screen off and on a couple of times, and it was fine. And it wasn't my fault his phone was next to the sink while I was doing dishes. Besides, it was an old phone, and I replaced it. I'm pretty normal. Faded jeans, an old gray hoodie, blue eyes, auburn hair that the summer sun had lightened, and a junior majoring in journalism. I'm not buff. Not like the men's swim team, anyway. But I'm not bad. Look at these guys. I've never seen so many six-packs in my life. Look out, universe. I'm developing an inferiority complex. I'm a photographer for the school newspaper. It's not as glamorous a job as it seems, but having a press pass gets me into all kinds of events. Like today, Friday afternoon. I'm at the swimming complex, and it's my job to cover the tri-school swim meet to see which college will be number one. Today was day one of two. We started at noon today, and then we'd get an early start and finish up tomorrow by one. The Olympic-sized pool was a long course pool, with an even 2.5 meter depth throughout. No shallow ends. This pool was for professional swimmers only. Next to it was the diving well, with three spring boards of varying heights and two taller platforms. Nobody was diving today. It had blue and yellow swim lane ropes installed, and the long-distance swimmers raced here. Currently, it was a 400 meter backstroke, both pools were divided into eight lanes, but the diving well had a five-meter depth. By the diving pool were two large jetted hot tubs the swimmers sat in between events. Around both pools were bleachers filled to capacity, and a lot of safety signs saying things like, Watch out for ropes, no running, no food, no glass, shower and use toilet before entering pool, and no goofing off. It's a big event for the swim team and even made the nightly news. A cameraman and a reporter had showed up, but I don't think they'd be here for very long. A one-column write-up and a couple of pictures would satisfy the editor of the school paper. If I got seriously lucky, and the local paper needed filler, my article would end up there. Every journalist has to start somewhere. The online article would have a little more detail, as in a couple of paragraphs, and a lot more pictures. I would make sure it had at least one picture of each of our swimmers. I don't like sports, and I can't swim, but I would do a good job. It was more than a one reporter job, but it's just me, as in, I'm the only one covering. Since the digital age began, fewer people get involved with physical print, like school newspapers and the school magazine. It's all online. Call me old-fashioned, but I think it's fun to see my work in physical print to hold something that I created. I think most people feel the same way. That's why I take the time to make it right. It's a lot of work. I take the pictures and I write the article and then I email it to my editor, who makes recommendations and emails it back for a rewrite. She usually wants more of a human interest angle, more emotion, more drama. I revise it and email it to her, and it's in the next issue. When I first signed on, I thought being a student reporter would be exciting, but a lot of time is sitting around waiting for the right moment to take the perfect picture or research the target person so I can ask the right questions. It's boring sometimes, but a necessary evil for my resume. Give me a real story, like crime and police drama, and something I can sink my teeth into. Not a swim meet. Still, what the editor wants, she gets. There is a big advantage I hadn't counted on. Lots of hot men in swimsuits. 
being the reporter and photographer, I get to be up close. Maybe I'll volunteer for all the swim meets. Swimmers, take your mark, the lead judge said into his microphone. Terry, get your head in the game, I chastised myself. Third to last event of the day. It's the 100 meter butterfly. I didn't even know what a butterfly stroke was until the first race of the day. Eight men lined up, one person per lane, and a couple of coaches stood behind them, giving last minute instructions. A warning buzzer sounded. The coaches took a step back and let the judges step next to the pool. Each lane had two judges, one at either end, and their job was to make sure each man touched the wall before flipping. And then the final judge had to verify the winner. Each swimmer wore a skin-tight jammer, not the little bikini speedos of a decade ago. These jammers stretched from just below the waist to just above the knee. It's tight, as if it were painted on. All the men from our college wore customized black jammers with a green swirl stripe on the left hip. Green was one of our school colors. The next team wore blue jammers with a double vertical white stripe on the left hip. And the third school wore red jammers, no stripe. I prepared my camera, a Canon power shot with all the accessories that the school newspaper had checked out to me. With the zoom on this baby, I can tell if a man shaved at 100 feet away. Which all the swimmers did. They had no body hair visible. It has something to do with drag in the water and having a streamlined swim profile. I think it looks sexy. The less high-tech gadget for my camera was the Ziploc bag Omar had custom taped around it. It's not a matter of if, but when, before you drop that thing in the pool. I'm betting you'll have it ruined in an hour, Omar had told me. The newspaper checked out the camera to me six months ago, and nothing had gone wrong. I'd been at the swim meet for six hours, and there still wasn't any problem. Omar was a neurotic pessimist. Ready, the lead judge yelled. The coaches said a final word to the swimmers. The judges took their positions. The swimmers bent over, feet on the starting blocks, ready to push off. I laid on the edge of the pool, getting the best angle of the swimmers in starting position. Three guys from our team were competing in this race. The announcer said something. One man in particular caught my eye, just like he had in his other races. Black skull cap, black goggles, black jammer with green swirls on his hip, and high chiseled cheekbones. His body was shaved smooth and had no fat anywhere. Nothing could break his concentration. But he broke mine. Davis Nantucket. I'd been watching him all afternoon, and not only because he was one of the better swimmers, he was one of the hotter ones too. I saw an ancient statue of Hermes in my art history class when I was a freshman, and Davis was built like that. So were most of the guys here, but Davis stood out. He had the arms, chest, and abs only seen in fitness websites, and now at a swim meet. There was something about his blue eyes and his confident smile that seemed warm and friendly. He had dark blonde hair under the skull cap and a small tattoo of a dolphin on his shoulder blade. The guys on his team liked him. I liked staring at him. Could I get Davis to talk to me? Could I work up the courage to ask him out? I didn't have a body like he did, and I couldn't swim, so I would have to get creative. I took a picture of him and of several other swimmers getting ready to dive into the water. A buzzer blared. Eight men blurred as they flew off the blocks and dove. I snapped pictures as fast as my camera would let me. I'll have to check later, but I got the instant Davis's hands touched water, and then a second later, as he surfaced a dozen feet away. Another man, wearing a red knee-length jammer, was even with Davis. That would be a great shot. I furiously took picture after picture of both men struggling to get the lead. I caught it all on film, and I took random pictures of the other guys as fast as I could click the button. It was all digital. I'd have a thousand pictures by the time the day was done, but I'd only use the best. The men reached the other wall and flipped, heading back to start as fast as they could. Another man pulled alongside them, also wearing a red suit. Davis must have seen him because he pounded his way through the water even harder and gained a foot on the other men. It could be a three-way split. 
They arrived at our wall and in microseconds flipped again and headed back to the far wall. Davis took the lead, but only by a few feet. They flipped again at the far wall on the last leg of the race. I shifted positions, adjusted the zoom, and focused on Davis's lane. Davis had to win. I'd get the winning shot. Davis' hand touched the wall nanoseconds before one of the guys in red trunks. I clicked. The winning shot was mine. The judges conferred with each other, comparing times. This had been a very close race. The coach must have announced something to the swimmers, but I couldn't hear with all the shouting. The digital scoreboard shifted from the previous race to the current one. It seemed to shimmer, and then the names and times appeared. Our team screamed, and Davis tore off his swimmer's cap and goggles and waved them. Davis was the first, and his score brought our team to first place. He won by a very slim margin. The time seemed microscopically small, but with a race like this, that was an eternity. I don't even like sports, and I can't swim, but I cheered with the guys. One of the guys gave Davis a hand and helped him climb out of the water. Another guy slapped him on the back, while a third thrust a water bottle Davis's way. Davis took a long swig. Now's my chance to talk to him. I mean, interview him. Davis, do you have time for a couple of questions, I yelled, running over. Some kind of rope was on the ground, and I stepped over it. Davis was panting, and he ran his fingers through his wet, blonde hair. He didn't say anything, but his eyebrows shot up. I'm Terry Block with the school newspaper. Hold still, I said. And three guys stood close, and I shot a couple of pictures. Print edition will be ready in a week, but the online one will be ready as soon as I put the article together. Davis took another swig from the water bottle and tried to catch his breath. When did you start swimming? I asked. About ten years ago, he said. How does it feel to win? What's your secret? I said. That was a dumb question, but I went with it. Winning feels good, but it is exhausting. We've been training twice a day for months to get ready. Two hour morning workouts in the pool, then two hours lifting weights and running treadmills in the afternoon, Davis said. Do you even have time for class? I asked. We don't have time for a social life, one of Davis's friends said. Up before five every day, in bed by nine, and lots of practice time. We barely have time for classes or a job, and my grades have dropped, Davis said. As much as I love being on the team, I can't wait for this season to be over. When can you start dating again? I blurted out. Had I really asked that? About three weeks, Davis said, a slow grin spreading across his face. Did you just say what I think you said? Are you asking Davis on a date? One of the other swimmers said. I opened my mouth to say something, but I couldn't think of what to say. Instead, my cheeks warmed, and suddenly my mouth was dry. The guys with Davis laughed, and one said, Don't you worry, reporter dude. My man is not seeing anybody right now. He's available to give private lessons, as in one-on-one. -on -one. You should start Saturday night. Eddie, Davis rolled his eyes, but I don't think it was at me. Um, the season ends in three weeks, I said. Guys, will you let us have a serious conversation, Davis said. Not for a second, Eddie said. Terry, step back, Davis said to me. I did, and Davis pushed Eddie into the pool. Eddie spluttered to the surface, laughing. Somebody wants to be social, he said. Terry, let's go for a walk, Davis said, and we walked to the far end of the Olympic-sized pool. The swimmers, judges, and coaches were getting ready for the next race, a 100-meter breaststroke, and I should be taking pictures. But right now, I was in heaven. How do I save this conversation? Definitely not by speaking fast, which is exactly what I did. I would like to date you, but not everybody is open to dating guys, and I don't even know if you're interested in guys, and I can't see why you'd want to date me, because I don't even know how to swim, but I would like to know more about you. Do we really have to wait three weeks? Davis grinned and ran his fingers through his hair. Slow down. Let's answer your questions one at a time. I haven't been on any date since before the season started, so yes, it would be nice. Yes, I'm open to dating guys, and I'm curious what it's like being a journalist, so I would like to get to know you a little. Terry, the team is heading out for pizza after the meet. Why don't you join us? That way you can interview us as a group, get something to eat, take all the pictures you need, and we can get to know each other. 
for one night, I'd be dating a swimming god and hanging out with the athletes. This wasn't my normal scene, but maybe I could stretch my comfort zone a little. I gave Davis a smile that I hoped wasn't insecure and asked, Seriously? Me? Where are you going? I'll drive over. Heartfire Gourmet Pizza, the place just below campus. They have a live band tonight, and we reserve tables. Don't worry, you won't be the only plus one there, Davis said. But you will be the only reporter. You'll get an exclusive. If we can get a laptop, I'll show you all the pictures I've taken so far, I said. The warning buzzer sounded on the second to last race. I've got to take pictures of the race, I mumbled. I'll see you after the meet, at Heartfires, Davis said. Wow, imagine me hanging out with the athletes. Maybe today was a better day than I gave it credit for. Wait a second. Did Davis just take a second look at me? A trim, slim, swimmer's body shaped smooth as glass, a face that could be on a magazine, and a star swimmer? Davis had the looks of a Greek god combined with a porn star, and he took a second look at me? He looked at me? Wow. I straightened my hair, smoothed my clothes, and glanced back. Did I blush? The judges had taken their places at the edge of the pool, and the swimmers had positioned themselves on their blocks. The buzzer sounded, and the racers dove into the water. I snapped picture after picture, and then the race was over. They set up for the last race, and it went just as fast as the previous race. As the judges tallied the times and the scores, the team, 24 guys plus the two coaches, gathered together at the side of the diving well. Some guys were shirtless and wore only jammers. Some wore sweats and all had crazy swim hair. The camera person from the television station took a video of the team while the coach gave a brief interview. They asked Davis about how he felt about crushing the pool record. I didn't know that, Davis said. I snuck in with my camera and took my pictures. The television camera person gave me a funny look. I flashed my press pass. He nodded, and I was in. The television crew might make a lot more money than me, but we were in the same profession. Once the group photo was done, Davis, Eddie, and a couple of his teammates walked over to me. After we get showered and changed, Coach wants to talk to the team. Let's say we meet you at Heart Fires in an hour. Eddie has a laptop we can use to look at your pictures, but it's an older model. What kind of cord and software do you use? Eddie said. I got out the cord and showed Eddie. Standard USB on one end, Rebel T6 on the other, and any picture display program should work. I use a freeware program I found, but if you're interested, I'll show you where you can find it too, I said. Free is the right price, Davis said. We spoke for a couple of minutes, then their coach called them over. Don't worry about me. I have a lot of pictures to go through, I said. Since today's portion of the swim meet was over, and tomorrow morning was the second portion, the judges cleaned up their notes and took off. The big screen shut down, and the guys from the other teams trickled out. I found a seat close to the diving well, plugged my earbuds in, found something not too wild to listen to, and shuffled through the 947 pictures I had taken today. Some pictures were easy to delete, Somebody had accidentally blocked the shot, or my timing had been off a second, or it had blurred, or it was similar to a better picture. A couple stood out as being possibly the best, including the one of Davis diving into his final race, his hands just barely above the water. That could be a good opener for the article. I made some notes in a notebook about how I would type this up, then scribbled a few paragraphs then made arrows to show which paragraph should go first. The overhead lights shut off, the swimming pool lights shut off, and a couple of emergency lights came on. Hello, I said. Nobody answered me. Everybody had left. Of course. They'd all be back tomorrow morning, so they could lock up and leave everything as it were. I'd been so quiet that nobody noticed that I was still here. I checked my phone. It had been an hour already? Davis and the team would be waiting for me at Hardfire Pizza. Nothing like being fashionably late for an impromptu date. I picked up my backpack and ran around the diving well. My foot caught on the ropes, and I tripped. Right into the diving well. 
The camera exploded out of my hand and fell into the dark water. I can't swim. I fumbled around. My hand finally touched something plastic, one of the floaters of the lane divider rope. I grabbed hold and pulled myself to it and held it tight. The floater was too small to do more than keep my head above water. My feet couldn't touch bottom. Help, I said, trying to keep water from going into my mouth. Help, I yelled. No one was here. I'm alone. The diving well, though similar in size to a regular pool, was deeper. Five meters deep. The edge of the well didn't look too far away. I pulled myself along the rope, foot by foot, until I got to the wall. My backpack went up first, then I pulled myself up. I was dripping wet. My notebook would be ruined. All the notes I had taken were nothing but wet paper. I gasped for air and took my wet shoes and socks off. Omar was right. I'm a klutz. Trust me to trip into a swimming pool. Good thing Omar hadn't seen me fall. He'd tease me forever. But it was a good thing Omar had taped a Ziploc around my camera. Wait. Where was my camera? All the pictures for the swim meet were on it. It would cost me a lot of money to replace the camera. It wasn't mine. The swimmers wanted to see their pictures. Davis wanted to see the pictures. My editor wanted to see the pictures. The camera was also my ticket, at least for tonight, to hang out with the athletes. Had I ever done that before? Everything I needed for the article was on the camera. A little tiny green light bobbed up and down on the dark water. The power light of my camera. Omar's protective Ziploc was airtight, and it had enough air inside to float my camera on the water. The bright side? My camera was currently waterproof and undamaged. The downside? It was next to one of the floaters for the lane rope, and at least five feet away from me. It would be an easy thing to get, for Davis or any other guy on the team. I can't swim, and... Except for the emergency lights, it's dark in here. But I had to have the camera. Swimming pools have fishnets so the attendants can keep the pool clean. I just had to find one. It took me five minutes of wandering around before I realized they didn't have any. They did have a locked door marked pool maintenance. I bet the nets were in there. I checked the changing rooms. Nobody was around. Everybody was eager to get out of here. The outer door was locked from the outside. If I left, I couldn't get back in. I couldn't leave until I got my camera. I'll miss the party. And Davis will think I stood him up. What do I do? I'll use my shirt as a net. There's plenty of ropes. I'll tie the two together and rescue my camera. I went back to the diving well and found one of the ropes. The rope was too thick. I'm alone. I can't swim. I can't touch the bottom of the pool. A really cute guy is waiting for me. Free pizza as well. And the guys want to see the pictures. But my life is floating just out of reach. However, maybe I can still use the shirt idea. If I hang on to the side and reach out as far as I can. I can use my shirt as a net and catch my camera. I stripped down to my boxer briefs. Good thing no one was here, and eased into the pool. The green power light on my camera seemed so close. Water made little lapping noises against the sides of the pool, and a ventilator in the ceiling made a constant hum. I slipped into the cool water and held onto the side of the five-meter-deep pool. That's sixteen feet. That's almost three times taller than me. Nothing was underneath me 
but water. If I lost my grip, I'd sink. Replacing the camera would cost too much money. All my pictures were on there. My editor would be furious. I had to get the camera back. I held the end of my shirt, stretched out as far as I dared, and flicked the shirt like a net. The shirt hit the water, but it was a foot short. But the slapping of the shirt on the water made little waves that sent the camera further away from me. Now what? I let go of the side of the pool, placed both hands on the lane dividers, and pulled myself out. If I slipped, there was no one around to rescue me. The soft breeze of the ventilator slowly blew my camera to the next lane divider. I inched my way out, getting closer to my camera. The swimming pool wall was so far away. The ground was so far from my feet. The other lane divider seemed unreachable. I reached out to try and touch the other divider. I had to get closer to my camera. The other divider was out of reach unless I pushed off this divider and grabbed the other divider. This water is really deep and it's really dark and I'm alone. I shouldn't be doing this. I ignored the fear leaping in my stomach and how shallow my breaths had become. I had to get the camera back. I had to meet the swimmers at Heart Fires. I had an article to write for the school newspaper. This was my chance to talk to Davis, maybe my only chance. Davis and Eddie and all the guys did swim. They made it look easy. I had to have my camera. I could retrieve my camera, follow the divider back to the edge of the pool, climb out, and be very late for pizza. It would still work. Taking a breath, I pushed off for the other lane divider. I sunk a few inches. I couldn't find the other lane divider. I couldn't find the lane divider I had held. Where were they? My hand slapped to the water. No divider. Aim for the green light. The water was too choppy. I couldn't find the light. Where was the wall? Somehow, I'd spun. Help, I said, but swallowed water. I coughed and flailed and splashed. Where was the damn divider? Which way was up? I tried again to grab something. Anything. I found nothing. Help, I gurgled, but water fluttered into my mouth. I had the weirdest thought. If only the camera could take a picture, I must have the stupidest look on my face. I splashed and waved my arms, or tried to. The water closed around my head. I couldn't breathe. Which way was up? Where was the divider? Something grabbed my hand and yanked it hard until I touched the rope. I pulled myself to the surface, clawing for a breath. Somebody grabbed me from behind. Easy, Terry. I've got you, and I'm not letting go, Davis said, making sure my hands held onto the rope lane divider. I breathed the cool air, my chest heaving. The water lurped up and down, the little green light visible about ten feet away. My, my, my camera, I said. You're more important, Davis said, gently holding me as we swam to the side of the pool. Once he had me sitting safely in the hot tub, Davis went back for the camera. When he came back, he sat next to me. I thought I was alone, I said. My voice choked and my breathing wavered. It hit me. I almost drowned, and Davis had saved my life. You almost were alone. Coach needed to talk to me without all the guys around, Davis said. Why? I asked. My times might qualify me for the Olympic trials. I saw your car as I was leaving. Came looking for you. That's when I heard the splashing. How do you feel? Davis asked. Stupid, I said. Davis had saved me. The least I could do was say, thank you. 
Just a second, Davis said, getting up. A minute later, the pool lights turned on, making the water a deep blue. Davis returned, sat beside me, and handed me a drink fresh from the vending machine. He had stripped to his boxer briefs, just like me. Are you sure you're all right? I nodded, and though I didn't know anything about him, I held his hand. Thank you. Davis nodded and wrapped his arm around my shoulders. This is when I like the pool best. Something about the darkness, being alone, the pool lights, the weird reflections made by the ripples, make magic happen. I don't get to do this often, but I like sitting here, watching the water, and thinking. What are you thinking about? I asked. That it's nice having someone to share the moment. Davis leaned in very close and whispered. If I taught you to swim, do you think we could keep seeing each other? I had almost drowned. I was almost naked. I had almost ruined the camera. This man had saved my life. I don't know what state my screwed up head was in, because I leaned over, and just before I kissed him, I whispered, My bathtub or yours? The end. Thank you for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Peace.